Welcome, everyone. Um, we are so pleased at the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities to have a live and in-person event for the first time in a very long time. So I'm so pleased to welcome people who are in the room and also, of course, uh, the audience on the webinar. Uh, I'm Dr. Matt Winnie. I direct the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. Did I need to move over this way? <laughs> I direct the Bioethics and Humanities Center here for the University of Colorado. And I will just serve uh, as an introducer today. We have an amazing panel uh, of, uh, of esteemed uh, speakers today. I'm gonna start uh, to my left here. Uh, Dr. Thomas Patterson obtained his AB from the San Diego State University, his Master of Science from the University of Georgia, and PhD from UC Riverside. Tom is an evolutionary sociobiologist and an experimental psychologist, a distinguished professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego, and he has renowned expertise on behavioral interventions among HIV positive persons and those at high risk of acquiring HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. He developed a scale to assess everyday functioning in schizophrenia that's been mandated for use by the FDA, and it's been translated now into 26 languages. Uh, Dr. Patterson and his wife, Dr. Stephanie Strathdy, have worked as a husband and wife research team on the US-Mexico border for over a decade. Um, and so I'm gonna turn now to Steph. Dr. Stephanie Strathdy is an infectious disease epidemiologist and the Harold Simon Distinguished Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego, where she's an Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences and where she co-directs the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, IPATH. She also teaches at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and she was named one of Time Magazine's most influential people in healthcare in 2018 because, as you are undoubtedly going to hear, she led the charge to use bacteriophages, viruses that attack bacteria, to help save her husband Tom's life when he experienced a deadly infection with a highly drug-resistant uh, bacteria. This was undoubtedly an act of love for her, but doing it involved building um, an enormous network of cooperative scientists across three different universities, the US Navy, and researchers around the globe. And she tells this remarkable story in a, a really compellingly readable way in a book called The Perfect Predator, A Scientist's Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug. In conversation with Dr. Strathy and her husband today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. John Samet, Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health. John is also an eminent epidemiologist and a pulmonologist. His work uh, nationally and internationally has focused on the health risks of inhaled pollutants like small particles, ozone, secondhand smoke, and radon. Dr. Samet has served on and chaired numerous committees of the National Research Council, the Institute of Medicine, the US EPA, and the FDA. He's been an editor and author for the reports of the Surgeon General on smoking and health since 1984, and received the Surgeon General's medallion first in 1990 and then again in 2006, which seems unfair, actually. Um, uh, among his many awards, uh, he received the 2004 Prince Mahidol Award for Global Health, awarded by the King of Thailand. And I'm going to skip all the other awards because they really will take more of our time. <laughs> I'm going to skip through to the fact that uh, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and received their David M. Rawl Medal for his contributions in 2015. But I want to say more importantly for our purposes today, John is a photographer and a storyteller himself, and he really understands the power of story and of imagery for science and for scientific communication. So I think he's the perfect person to talk to Steph and Tom about the use of story in science communication today. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Matt. And I know uh, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Steph and Tom and uh, organize this conversation with them. I, I'll just add to my to Matt's introduction that I first met Steph, who just determined that it was 1998 when she joined the faculty of the Department of Epidemiology at Hopkins uh, when I was chair. She was touted as an up-and-coming uh, 
HIV AIDS epidemiologist, uh, had been doing important work on needle exchange in uh, Vancouver. And it was her second day that she was in the Congress talking to the staff about needle exchange, which was incredibly controversial at the, uh, at the time. But she went on to forge an important program uh, at Hopkins and then moved to uh, UCSD, where she's done really innovative pioneering work uh, along the border with the sex workers and others joining with Tom and uh, many other things. What you're going to hear is a remarkable story of how Steph, at Tom's most dire moments, found uh, a way to save his life. And uh, the story has obviously imprinted both of them. It will imprint you when you hear it. And uh, a book has come on, has a lot to teach us uh, about things. And I think some of the conversations with Tom and Steph over the weekend, you need to hear from Tom, for example, what it means to be in an ICU for months at a time with people standing by your bedside doing what people do when they stand by the bedside and they shouldn't be doing, as you will learn. So they have, Tom and Steph have a lot to um, teach us. And I think what we'll do just to uh, lead off is I'm going to ask them to say whatever they'd like to say to get started. And then we'll have some focused comments and opportunities, I think, as we move forward for those with us in person and virtually, I think, to make offer uh, their comments and uh, questions. And for those of you here, there are books uh, that can be signed uh, right, right afterwards. So let me uh, not hand you this, because you're already mic'd up, and uh, go for it. Sure. Thanks very much, John, and everybody for in inviting us here today. And thanks to the audience. Um, I guess I'll just give a little bit of a synopsis of what happened, and then um, enlist uh, you all for questions. Um, so Tom and I actually went on vacation in 2015, um, and we were in Egypt over Thanksgiving weekend, um, and um, he wanted to see the Valley of the Kings. It was on his bucket list. And when he got violently ill after having this wonderful seafood meal on top of a cruise ship, and the next day we were supposed to see King Tut's tomb, um, you know, I thought he had food poisoning, and I said, well, you know, at this rate, you're going to see King Tut's tomb, but feet first in your own tomb. And I was <laughs> laughing and just thought that was really funny. That actually turned out to be pretty close to what was like, going to happen. Um, he turned violently ill, um, and uh, first thing I did uh, was call home because I'm in a department of medicine. I know one of the top infectious disease doctors, um, Dr. Chip Schooley who actually used to be the chief of infectious diseases here at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And he said, get Tom to the closest hospital. He is very sick. He's going to need at least fluids. And, um, you know, we've got, we got to find out what's going on. So there was no actually hospital in Luxor. There was only a clinic. He was um, diagnosed with pancreatitis and inflammation of the pancreas. And um, they stabilized him, and he was medevaced first to Germany and then back to San Diego. Well, it turned out what was going on is that he'd had a gallstone attack and had formed a giant abscess to form inside his abdomen. But inside that abscess moved in a superbug, a bacteria that's resistant to all antibiotics. And that ended up to be the fight for his life over the next nine months that he was in the hospital. So when my colleagues were actually caring for him in San Diego, and they turned to me one day and they said, you know, there's nothing else that we can do. Um, fighting for his life. And um, do you want to start kidney dialysis? Well, I knew he was already on three medications to keep his heart pumping. He was on a ventilator. And that dialysis meant the end. So I asked him what he wanted to do. Um, he was in a coma. I wasn't sure if he could hear me. But I said... If you want to live, please squeeze my hand and I'll leave no stone unturned. Well, that was a really critical moment. Tom's going to tell you in a minute what was going through his head. But when he squeezed my hand back really hard, I was very excited. But then I thought, oh, crap, like I'm not a medical doctor. I have some of the best people around helping me. What am I going to do now? So I did what anybody would do. I went home, hit the internet, and did some research. And I have a rusty old degree in microbiology that turned out to be pretty handy because I found something called phage therapy. 
and bacteriophage, or phage for short, are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. They had been discovered over 100 years ago, um, and they were used for a time before penicillin came on the scene to treat bacterial infections. But um, in fact, the former Soviet Union took them up very readily, and they, it became known as Soviet medicine. And that cast a pall over the field because the Soviets were the enemy. And when penicillin came on the scene, phage therapy in the West was relegated to the back burner. So this is experimental treatment. Now Chip and my colleagues at UCSD said, look, this idea of yours to treat Tom with phage therapy is really enough to save his life. And from my first email to these strangers to the day that we tried phage therapy on Tom was only three weeks, but they were the longest three weeks of my life. Needless to say, he's sitting beside me, so you know that the treatment was a success. And when it was, um, people said, you know, this is something that really could actually be an important arsenal to the superbike crisis, which is a global health problem. By the year 2050, at least 10 million people are going to be dying of superbugs every year. That's a cost of $100 trillion to each year to the global economy. So um, we decided that we would put our story down in a book. And um, it was quite a journey because we're, we're both scientists that write academic articles, not uh, memoirs. And we'll tell you a bit about that process. But first, I'll, I'll let Tom tell you, uh, maybe you want to tell them what was going through your head when I um, said, squeeze my hand. Well, first off, let me just say that the story that I know, most of which I learned from Stephanie and others after the fact, because as a patient who was in a coma and whatnot, I experienced the whole thing from a completely different perspective. So I study in part of my work, patients with schizophrenia, and I thought I understood what hallucinations were all about. But what I didn't understand was if you're in an ICU for a long period of time, you're inevitably going to have hallucinations, which I experienced. And part of what I learned was you're not a loaf of bread when you're in a coma. You can actually hear, not all the time, but you can hear what's going on. And when doctors come in and start talking about futility and the fact that this patient's going to die, that colors the hallucinations that you're having. So for the particular moment that Steph was talking about, I had hallucinated that I was a snake. And I mean literally a snake who was being uh, filmed for a documentary on death. I was dying and they were documenting. So I heard beetle music in the background. You know, the Beatles uh, were playing this kind of rough music. That well, part was real. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing was that, you know, there was music playing in my room all the time because I'm a real music buff. And one of the things that I was hearing was Beatles music. So that's kind of coming from that. But I was hearing it in this very surreal way. Why was I a snake, you might ask? Well, I was a snake because they had put a um, one of the bronchoscopes down my throat, which is a little like a snake. It's segmented down my throat. So I viewed it as a snake at that moment. I'm having people standing over me, telling me I'm going to die or talking about he's going to die. So I interpreted it as that. Now, Steph asks me if I want to live. I have a challenge. I'm a snake. I don't have hands. She's asking me to squeeze her hand. And she, you know, I know she's waiting, but I can't think how am I going to squeeze her hand without my hands? So I wrap my snake body around her hand and I squeezed. And she tells me I squeezed too hard, but I didn't know, you know, it was a boa constrictor, I guess. <laughs> well, he told me that story months later, obviously, because he couldn't talk or communicate in any way. And when he told me that, I realized that we'd had the same ordeal, but we had different experiences. And so our book ended up being my experience and his experience juxtaposed. So you have Tom's voice and Tom's hallucinations juxtaposed against what was really happening. And if you ask him, he'll say, my world was really happening. 
So anyway, that was one of the very interesting aspects of, of, of how we ended up telling our story. So let me um, ask you both to say something about the decision to write a book and uh, how you made it. And then next, say a little bit about switching in your mind from writing table five shows to writing a real story. Say a little bit about both. Well, people had said to us that they thought that our story could be a movie. And I thought, well, if it's going to be a movie, then a book. And um, so initially, when the first um, patient um, was treated after Tom, because now many, many people have been treated with the same protocol that Tom received for phage therapy, I realized that the potential for helping other people and using our story as a platform would, would be you know, immense. And so I started to jot things down. And I had um, been writing on Facebook to share our story to, with people that couldn't come in to visit Tom. And there were 52 pages of Facebook entries. And there was 1,300 pages of electronic medical records. And so I obtained all of that. But then I didn't know if Tom was going to be able or even willing to do this. And that became a conversation that we needed to have. Yeah, I think that for me, I was suffering from PTSD in a major way initially. But, I mean, I can remember laying in the hospital bed and a small child in the Middle East had received phage therapy. And it was because of my case. And I started to realize how important my situation was. And so, despite the emotion that I had experienced, I decided I needed to talk about what I had experienced. Now, the actual production was an issue for me because I had dysgraphia. I was still had motor problems initially. And so I was dictating to Steph during the period of time when I was home, telling the stories about my hallucinations and you know what the experience was of laying in a bed for that length of time and you know what pain and everything was like. So it was for me an incredibly emotional experience just to tell the story. But for all of the global energy and the local energy in my family, the nurses, the doctors, all of that time and energy that went into saving my life, I really felt we needed to pay it back. And so this was the way to start that payback. This was the R, it was necessary. So that's how I convinced myself and forced myself to really begin that process. It was really difficult at first because, you know, again, we'd never written anything like this before. And so the first thing I did was contact a friend of ours who writes for Science Magazine, Cohen, who is very well known in the HIV field. And he's written several books. And I said, so um, can you help us find a publisher? And he said, you don't need a publisher. You need an agent. You get an agent. The agent helps you find the publisher. And then I thought, oh, man. This is like, there's a whole business behind this that I know nothing about. And I realized that we needed to understand the business. And so one of the first things we did was buy this book called um, How to Get Your Book Published by Ariel Eckstutt and David Sterry. If you're ever thinking about writing a book, um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and actually, um, once we did have a book deal, um, I wrote them and thanked them for their book because it really helped us navigate through the process. And they did a Q&A with us on medium.com. Um, and it was, you know, really quite interesting how that happened. Yeah, but the other thing that happens right away is they anticipate you might have a film. So you're also getting a film agent right out of the box, which is, you know, again, another surreal aspect of it. So it's another book that you have to read because the Hollywood business is not the book yeah, business. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's another story. We're still kind of in the middle of that run right now. But um, so at, the, at that point, um, you know, we were writing the book initially to get to know each other again because we'd been side by side in the hospital for what ended up being nine months but without being able to really communicate. And then we start to realize, well, this book is for other people. So we need to decide how we're going to present ourselves to the world. 
And we decided to be Steph and Tom, not Dr. Strathy and Dr. Patterson. And that ended up being a really good decision because now we know from the COVID pandemic that science and scientists are, are distrusted and that a lot of people don't have um, much insight into how scientists think and live like everybody else. So that, that's something I'm really glad about. Um, so I'm, I'm Steph and, and he's Tom to all of you and um, we're ready for your questions. Okay. Um, we'll keep going. We're gonna have, uh, I think things coming from the chat eventually, is that right? Wait, well, well, he is doing that. That's what I thought. Okay. But I think we'll go. I to, I'm not out of things to ask you. So um, for sure, I mean, we, we can go for another hour or so. And, uh, but, you know, I, I actually, to, I'm probably really talking about direct this to you. I mean, it seems like you have an awful lot to teach caregivers. And, you know, do you intend to do something additional that might give guidance because I've been one of those standing by the bedside with the patient with, you know, 10 tubes. And, you know, I think we've, as you say, people forget that that individual is a person. And um, well, one aspect of this is we've already written at least one chapter on um, patient or patient centered care. centered care. And, you know, basically, I think a lot of the lessons I've learned and I've tried to talk about, I mean, initially, when I was still in the hospital, I was, oh, I need to do another model, you know, because as a scientist, you gotta have a model. So I'm, you know, drawing a model of who's involved with the care, what aspects of that are important, and it just became kind of too formalized. I've thought about another book, which, you know, would be the patient-oriented book and the kind of lessons I learned. I think. The main lessons, just in a nutshell, that I would, you know, tell family is even though, and I know you can't get into the intensive care or even the hospital a lot of times during COVID, but once this is over, you're back to the situation I was in where you could have visitors. I've got to tell you, somebody was by my bedside virtually 24-7, family, friends, students, they had actually set up a, a schedule so that too many people weren't in my uh, room too often. But that time, I mean, even when I was in a coma, having that stimulation, I think really helped me keep my cognitive ability because if you're in a coma for as long as I was, like three months, there's a high probability you're gonna be cognitively impaired. Now you might argue that I am and I'm gonna, fool you right now I can say that I'm not. <laughs> but I think it's important to keep up that stimulation, but there's also the emotional part. Even though people were in PPE, they had their gloves on. When somebody touched me, it was like an electric shock. I got energy from that, which helped me survive, helped me, you know, decide I wanted to live. And I mean, People have asked me about resilience. What is it? You know, I've thought a lot about it, and I have to tell you, despite the fact that it's been now over four years since I got out of the hospital, <clears throat> I'm still processing a lot of what happened to me, trying to understand, you know, what near-death experiences are like when I really approached that last moment. And no, I didn't see the light on the other side for your information right out of the box, but I did see the light of life when I approached death, when I got very, very close to it, I decided I wanted to live. And then I fought for life. And I really, truly felt like I saw light of life, not of death, not the other side. So, I mean, for me, I think what you, you learn lessons is for the medical staff, that you're not a loaf of bread, that you shouldn't be talking about fertility, that this is a person, you should be talking to them as, a, as if they're going to live, even if you don't believe they are. You know, touching them is important. Telling them what you're going to do is important. All of those things. And I've got to tell you, I had a remarkable staff taking care of me. I mean, at every specialty, 
on earth because every single of my uh, organs was in failure at one point or another. So the medical side, the family side, you don't realize how stressful it is. You forget the family is going through that ordeal too. And so trying to support family is really important. They're supporting me. Now I support them or try to. They have PTSD, my daughters, and have gone through therapy for that too. So there's that aspect, which is complicated. And then there's the public and trying to, you know, to get this word out about phage therapy and understanding what it is to be on a ventilator and unable to communicate and being near death and all of the experiences that you go through, the, you know, depersonalization. And I think finally, one of the really important things is people have this fantasy that when you come out of a, well, there's two parts, I guess, when you come out of a coma, it's going to be like you see in the movies. You're suddenly going to wake up and you're going to go, oh, gee whiz, you know, I would like to have a hamburger and I want to, you know, go out jogging and I'll do all of these things. It's like, for me, it was as if I was coming out of a fog and memories came back to me like Christmas tree lights lighting up one at a time. And I was coming back to life memories would come flooding back when somebody would trigger a memory and then i'd remember a whole string of other things the other aspect that i'll quickly mention is that you forget is i was in the hospital for nine months it's five times as long on is the rule of thumb to recover from that period of time in bed so it's four years to get back at least and i'm over four years out and i'm still doing some recovery it's a long haul, learning to walk, you know, and all of the other aspects of everyday life that you have to go through. So for, you can't forget the recovery is just as challenging as the actual experience in the hospital. So let me ask one more comment, then maybe we'll go on to what is in the uh, <coughs> chat, but you've, <coughs> your experience has brought phage therapy back. And talk a little bit about what you're doing next, this next challenge you've taken on, and you know, and literally a whole new business of development and innovation. And talk about that because I, I mean, I think the book and Tom's experience have obviously brought back a therapy that had obviously been discarded when it shouldn't have been. Well, what's interesting is the, the book has really opened the conversation about the global threat of antimicrobial resistance and the potential for this forgotten therapy, phage therapy, to combat it. Um, and uh, so many people became aware of this because of our story. You know, it was picked up in the press or in People magazine. We were on the Today Show. Um, and then there was um, publications, um, interestingly, because of this bias that I talked about, because of it being Soviet science. Um, initially, the top journals passed over the case report that um, Dr. Schooley ultimately published in a good journal, but New England Journal, JAMA, um, all, Lancet, they all said no. But then after the case report was published and, and people were talking about this, all of those journals ultimately published um, JAMA, published a Q&A with Dr. Schooley. Lancet commissioned a commentary and a book review um, written by Lori Garrett, who's an eminent author. It's a science writer. And, um, you know, it, and, and we've gone on to now start clinical trials on phage therapy. So the NIH has funded its first phage therapy trial to the tune of $12 million. Um, and there's several trials that are underway. Um, Tom's protocol, because it was published, uh, has led to many other patients. Um, we don't even know how many because the FDA won't give out um, the information for the US because it's considered, you know, private information. But we um, have met other people um, whose lives have been saved or their limbs have been protected from amputation as a direct result of his case. So for us, we know our story was one of privilege. And without the resources that we had, we wouldn't have been able to make this happen. And so part of the storytelling was really to make this more accessible for other people. So phage therapy still has a long way to go. But it's now seen as one of the most promising alternatives to antibiotics that's out there. And in fact, just the other day, a congressman from Virginia 
who was um, talking at a congressional hearing about antimicrobial resistance in the Pasteur Act, which is before Congress right now, uh, mentioned our book and told everybody to read it and said, you know, this is the future. That, like Tom became the poster child for this post-antibiotic era that we're facing. And, and now he is the poster child for the success. So, um, I mean, obviously, I, I went through this to save my husband's life. I had no idea that it was going to have a ripple effect across the world and it's still happening. Um, and we just see this as, um, as a message of hope. Um, evidence-based hope. Steph and Tom visited with a group uh, today at CU Boulder. There's work going on uh, on this campus and, and elsewhere. And I was struck, and I think I said this to you about when we were wandering through airports pre-COVID in Dulles Airport, there was a sort of a sign announcing somebody whom you knew, if I recall correctly, who was doing phage phage therapy startup. And, uh, That's right. In fact, there's a phage company that was formed as a direct result of Tom's case. And it's no longer a startup anymore. It's entered Series B financing. I have to disclose that we actually were given stock in this company, so I won't um, belabor that. But it's been remarkable to see this flood of biotechs um, moving into this space. So um, we're, we're hopeful. So let's go and ask you. Yes. There you go. Sorry, do this. Hi, uh, my name is Josh. I work in uh, the Arphage uh, Research Lab here in Brecht Dirkop's lab. Um, so first off, oh, th uh, thank you so much for your hard work to to move phage therapy forward. And you know, Breck always says that you your story is the one that kind of restarted it um, for a lot of the Western world. Um, I have two questions for you. First, what was the conversation like between you and Dr. Schooley to go for phage therapy? And I understand, you know, for a lot of current patients for phage therapy, it is a last resort, right? It's a conversation you have to have, right? Is this going to work? Everything else has failed, right? Now we move on to phage. And my next question for you is how do you see phage therapy fitting into our current, you know, antimicrobial response in the clinic? So um, when I stumbled across phage therapy in the scientific literature and it rang a bell from my class of, in microbiology from 1986, and I thought, oh my gosh, and this yet yeah, I immediately sent Chip an email. This was like the wee hours of the morning. And you know, it never dawned on me that he was pacing the floor too because he knew that Tom was dying. And the exact email wording is in the book. It's like something like, Hey, Chip, um, you know, I know that we're losing Tom and things are getting desperate and we need to think outside of the box. What about phage therapy? It sounds a little woo-woo, I know, but, you know, um, I'm willing to give it a shot or something like that. And he wrote right back and said, what an interesting and intriguing idea. If you can find phage that will match Tom's bacterial isolate, I'll call the FDA and get approval to use it on a compassionate basis. So first, I was elated by that. Um, but second when he said the words compassionate basis, that was the first time that Chip admitted to me that Tom was dying. So I knew how desperate that was. And then, then came this overwhelming like dilemma. How am I gonna find the phages to match his you know, bacterial isolate? This isn't my field. And the more reading I was doing, realized that there's 10 million, trillion, trillion, <laughs> like a non-million number of phages on the planet. So it's like worse than a needle in a haystack. But that led to this global village stepping up to the plate. So that story is obviously, you know, the, what the book is about. It's not about the what, it's a, as much about the how. Um, and where phage therapy might fit in really is as an adjunct to antibiotics. Um, we've seen synergy between antibiotics and phage so that one makes the other um, better by potentiating its effects. Um, and um, when there's no recourse because someone has a pan-resistant infection that's resistant to all antibiotics, phage therapy may be the only thing that's available. But we need to obviously have the clinical trials conducted in a rigorous fashion because the drug is alive and so it's not like your standard clinical trial. And it isn't just one trial that's going to be needed, it's many. 
so we're, we're years away probably, but look what we did with COVID, right? In a year's time, we got you know five or more vaccines developed. And so where there's a will, there's a way. And that's why we need stories like ours um, and to open this conversation to make um, the field and the general public aware. Tess? I, thank you so much. I have a comment and a question. And I'll start with my comment because I've been sitting here and thinking about your book and thinking about Jean-Dominique Bobby's uh, extraordinary memoir, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And with that book, after his locked-in syndrome, we get this window that you're giving us into the mind of someone, into the memories and imagination. And so I so appreciate that your book will join this small section of books. And my question is really around that, and especially for you, Tom, given your lifelong work with schizophrenia and other you know, mental illnesses. How has this changed your view of the wonders of the human mind and brain, especially regarding serious mental illness and things like Alzheimer's? Thank you. Sure. Um, actually, I, I, for over 30 years, worked with Alzheimer caregivers too. So I have a lot of insight into that. <clears throat> That's the caregiver side. But in terms of uh, parallels and my understanding, have changed dramatically. I, I thought I understood what hallucinations were. And I believe that, I mean, obviously I cannot tell you what other people's hallucinations are like. I've read about others. I've talked with a lot of schizophrenics and they tell me about their experiences. And I can tell you that my experience was qualitatively different from theirs. My experiences are real. That is to say, my being a snake was, is part of my real experience. It's part of my real memory that I, you know, it's, I really was in these situations. I really walked through the desert for a hundred years. I spent that time, that's my entire memory. When you talk to a patient with schizophrenia, they have hallucinations. They don't see them as real. I mean, they act as if they're real, but they understand that they've gone over a red line and that they're no longer in touch with reality. But it's, a you know, for them, it's not remembering as if it was your life. It's, a you know, they may believe they're president of the United States, but they are not. In, in their memories, they're not walking around <clears throat> thinking about how wonderful it was being the president. They do say, once they're no longer uh, having that psychotic experience, it's the worst part of being a schizophrenic, is waking up and realizing you're not the president. That's the most dangerous time for a schizophrenic. Most times that they have in danger of having a suicide. For me, that isn't the, the case. I mean, for me, I try to figure out why did I have this particular hallucination? Why did I have that? So I've come to understand the differences between ICU psychosis and the patient that has schizophrenia and that the origins are quite different. You know, for me, the, the origin came from toxic medications from toxins from the infection, and from sleep deprivation from being in the hospital. I mean, you never get a night's sleep. Somebody's waking me up. I mean, I was that experimental guinea pig that was needed for phage therapy. So they're drawing blood from me every two hours. That means I'm never sleeping. You know, and I, I, it took me forever to realize that part of my problem was I wasn't getting any sleep. And they finally decided when I was getting better, put up a sign, let me sleep for at least four hours. Yeah. And that was a great boon for me, you know. And but, you know, your question brings up um, a very interesting um, lesson, I think, for anybody who's going to be writing a book. Um, and it's like, what is the comparator? Yeah. Um, and so you brought up the, the diving bell and the butterfly, which is a, 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 a story, but it's also become a film. We tried to watch the film. 
that it was right after um, we, he got out of the hospital and, and both of our PTSD triggers went nuts. So we should try again now that we've, we've got those totally, I mean, mostly under wraps. But another book that really spoke to me when we were writing was um, The uh, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, and what I liked about that book is it had medical history, and we talk about the strange history of phage therapy in our book, but also that we're part of it now. And so the, the writer, Rebecca Sklute, is researching this, and she's part of this, and she's weaving in and out of, of, of that history. So I thought that was, you know, uh, an, and it's obviously been a bestseller, and you know, Oprah turned it into an HBO special. Um, and another one was Brain on Fire, um, a, a, a young woman who um, had a strange um, medical ailment and was hospitalized and then was going crazy and had to deal with that. So all of those um, helped us because you read those and you think, okay, these are the books that are going to be on the shelf. And when you're trying to sell your book to a publisher, you're saying this is a cross between The Diving Bell and the Butterfly and, you know, The, the Mortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. But... Um, with Aaron Brockovich and Contagion or something like, you know, like that, uh, which is how our book has been described a little bit. Um, and then also we wrote it initially as what the genre is an illness memoir. I didn't even know what that was because I hadn't read that book, How to Get Your Book Published. And first, all the publishers passed on it. They said this is a really, really interesting winning couple, but, you know, illness memoirs don't sell. And so um, our agent, um, literary agent, Gail Ross, who's very well known, she turned to us and said, the market has spoken. Um, unless you're willing to totally revamp this because they want the hot zone, they want a medical thriller. And we were just going back to work. And um, I thought, oh man, like, you know, how am I gonna do this? So she suggested that we get a co-writer and that was Teresa Barker who had written and co-written a lot of books. I said, I don't want a ghostwriter. I want to learn how to do this. She said, you can you know, create any kind of arrangement you want. So Teresa and I revamped this, and she played a really important role in deciding what parts of our history um, and us getting to know each other as a couple should we show the world. Because the editing is actually some of the most important part. It's like, this story would interest people. This story would only interest nerds. <laughs> And then, you know, that process was very important and it was a really good idea because it took the section of the book right before Tom got phage therapy and made it the very first chapter. And that was the, the gotcha moment. The hook. The yeah. Hook. The yeah. other thing, I mean, there's a good example of how it got edited. In the original men, uh, manuscript, there were descriptions of a lot more cases of septic shock that I had gone through. And they, the editor said, this is exhausting for the reader. <laughs> <laughs> we went, well, sorry. But then you realize you're not writing it for you, right? Well, maybe initially we were, but then, you know, to make it palatable, we had to edit out, you know, so you maybe only saw two cases of septic shock instead of seven. <laughs> so let's see, yeah. We have things in the chat. Yeah, so we'll uh, move to the chat just for uh, a minute and maybe we can go back and forth. Um, so we have a question from Will, who's a student, and he submitted a question in advance and also during the program. He's curious about the process of phage therapy. So it's, it, um, could you talk a little bit more about that, how long it took that, that process of finding that needle in the haystack and, and what it was like um, to actually administer that, that therapy? Well, in, in reality, it only took three weeks, but it was the longest three weeks of my life from that first initial email to when we had, you know, a phage cocktail ready for Tom. But half of that time was actually purifying the phages to get them ready to administer intravenously because nobody knew whether it was going to kill them or cure them. And we needed to make sure that those phages were scrubbed um, clean. Um, so... Um, but three weeks um, is too long for somebody who's undergoing septic shock. The, the problem was is that we went directly to the environment to source these phages because when you're looking to find phage to match a certain bacterial infection, the best place to go is where there's a lot of bacteria. Where there's a lot of bacteria? Where? Sewage. Turns out 
barnyard waste and sewage and bogs and things like that are terrific places. Uh, wildlife scat. I mean, I just, I, I wanted to wake him up and say, you wouldn't believe what we're going to treat you with. <laughs> But um, you know, it was it was a crazy thing. But when you compare that to ten to fifteen years it takes to develop a new antibiotic that's like a billion dollars or more, there's no comparison. What we really need moving forward is a phage library. It's kind of like a walk-in uh, you know, cooler, where the phage are already identified and characterized and sequenced, and then it would be very easy to match phage um, probably within a day or two. Um, so that's the future, but we have to put that library together. Right now it's like having a million locks scattered all over the world, and you've got a million keys, and you need to find the key to match those locks. So <laughs> we have Matt, and then Martin will go back to chat. Sure. So... Um, I hope this isn't um, a question you don't feel comfortable answering, but I would love to hear a little more about what Tom just alluded to and what you alluded to earlier in sort of getting to know each other again after this experience. Um, the, I, it just strikes me that the personal aspects of this and how you choose what parts of that go into a book and what parts of that remain you know, yours. Um, I've spoken to one other author who's wrote, written both memoirs and, and fiction and said that um, it's only going to be a really good book if it's painful to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if what you're revealing is, is, is real. Yeah. Um, and I, it was a, a matter of initially my, my greatest fear, I have to admit, was everybody's going to know how crazy I really am. And they're going to think that I'm, you know, just absolutely out of my tree constantly. So there was that issue for me. And I, you know, just basically decided I'm going to open up entirely. I mean, I've always been somebody who's, you know, very open anyway. I'm a, you know, a talker. Never shut up if you give me the opportunity, unless I'm in competition with Steph. And then it's an issue. But I think for both of us in our um, getting to know each other phase, it was first, she was exhausted, you know, and, and so there was a lot of emotion that was, you know, aimed at me because at that point I still needed a lot of help even after we had decided to write this. And I mean, you know, like, She'd say, well, why don't you just write this down? And I'm, you know, this motor thing, I was just shaky. I couldn't do it. But I could talk. And so I started to talk about it. And that's when she discovered just how different the experiences were. Well, that's when we discovered the parallel experience that we had. And I think for both of us, it was just knowing how much we loved each other. It was remarkable. I mean, I, for me, epiphanies to, you know, I've always thought, yeah, I'm an independent, you know, kind of a person that walks through the world kind of by myself. And, and then when I discovered all of these people lighting candles for me all over the world. Yeah, I think um, one of the um, scenes that we relay in, in the book um, when we first started to talk to one another about what we went through was, um, was, was really remarkable. And it was when he was in the hospital in Germany and they, he, he got ravenously hungry and the doctors there let him eat whatever he wanted. And it turns out they knew that he was going to become like uh, this, what looked like the exorcist, you know, like having this black projectile vomit which hit the wall and <laughs> was just a, a giant mess. And so when I was telling him about this, he said, oh, well, that's not what happened to me. He says, I was a Buddha, and I was very serene and peaceful, and the world wanted to receive my gift, and I opened my mouth, and all of these little silver tassels just floated to the floor, <laughs> and people were so excited to receive them that they were running and picking them up. And I just, like, I, I like yelled and screamed and I laughed and then we cried and then we held each other and then we just, and I just said 
this is nuts. Like, <laughs> we need to write this down. So there were moments like that a lot. So I would get up at five in the morning and write for two hours, and then he would get up, and his dreams were invading his life, and so he would tell me what his dreams were about, and then I would write that down. I would read it back to him, and he goes, no, 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 it's like this. And so, you know, that process was how we both became, uh, I guess, able to understand what each other went through. And then we, we worked with the co-writer to decide what was going to stay. And I have to tell you, the, the hallucinations were the, the least edited of the book. And that's the part that Kirkus said, um, dark, surreal, poetic. And, and one of our agents said, you should put that on a mug. Kirkus never has reviews like that. <laughs> so maybe a little more from chat, and then we can probably come to coming to a close, unfortunately. Yeah, so this might tie it all together. This is a question from Kendra, who's a researcher on campus. And she's wondering, how did you transition from being a practitioner to a science communicator as well? And what support is needed to help other scientists and practitioners be effective in this capacity? Well, I think that's still happening. I mean, both of us are science communicators now. Um, one of the, the tips that I learned early on when we started to write was that we needed to build our platform, uh, our social media platform in particular. So I was already on Twitter, um, but I became very active on Twitter. And, um, and I learned to connect to people that might be interested in our story. So um, somebody who I met on Twitter, who's here today in the audience, uh, Josh, um, hi Josh, um, we're going to have lunch today. And, um, and so that kind of connection is really special because you realize that there's like-minded people out there that can benefit from hearing your experience. And, and, and I hear from the people who are infectious disease uh, physicians what it's like for them. And so it becomes this conversation. And I think, though, that as something like Twitter becomes a, a, a level playing field for people to communicate, you realize that you need to have a common language. So if you're talking a very esoteric language um, and with acronyms, people aren't going to understand. So you really need to identify metaphors that will help people um, relate. So for example, biofilms are something that infectious disease physicians and people who are microbiologists deal with all the time. And I thought, when I read about them, I said they're kind of like the microbial version of the Borg. And so most people that, you know, are the Star Trek new generation folks know that the Borg are, you know, these, you know, a mishmash of part machine, part human, and, um, and, and have their own kind of a community that they think has won. And that, to me, is what biofilms are like. And so someone said, I finally understand those now. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing that I would say particularly with an audience that are, are educators. One thing I learned from Steph when we first started dating, and she was still at Hopkins, and when she came to San Diego, I think it was the first uh, dissertation committee that we were actually on together. And she has this one question she always asks students. She says, you know, and many of our students are doing work with sex workers, which are really stigmatized, and Fox News is going to come after you, et cetera. So she says, I want you to tell, to, to, I'm Fox News. You've got 30 seconds to tell me about your study. And that really, I think, is something that students are not taught, you know, to communicate their research, to understand in layman's terms what it is that they find. And I know it's, it was a real epiphany for me because even myself, when I would speak, I, I did the scientist talk. You get into that gibberish and you don't get down to the core what matters about that study. And I think we as educators need to be educating our students at all levels how to do that. And I mean, I don't know how your undergraduates are trained, but I know the first undergraduate course, lab course that I taught, I thought oh, it'll be really easy for students instead of writing a paper, I'll have them do an oral presentation. And literally, I had the health student health call me up and say, what are you doing to these students? I've got half your class in here with diarrhea. <laughs> and, and they're really sick. They don't know how to do it. They've never spoke. 
So I think we need to start at a lower level undergraduates, get them talking more and to make that an experience that goes throughout their training. And I think, you know, for us older guys, we need to learn about it more too. I mean, John is a great communicator, I know, and yeah. that's not a problem, but there are many of us who didn't really communicate well. Uh, thanks, I wonder, we are sort of at time, and I wonder if you, uh, either of you wanna have any last, last words or we can wind up and we have books outside and Two people to sign a step down there. And the book is extraordinary, and I think you're extraordinary in telling us about it. So thank you so much for sharing. Our pleasure. Thank you. Okay.